regard I want to connect this session with the plenary discussion that we had before lunch no and we would like to emphasize that one of the objectives of this APPC and DPRM is po our policies no? approaches and interventions that would allow us to expand the middle class right that has been and even in a discussion earlier. However, we must be able to draw the line in expanding the middle class and also managing the middle income trap, which has been evident in the plenary session earlier. So in our discussion for this afternoon, we would like to focus, no? focus our attention on these policies, on these interventions that our experts that we have right now with us, focusing on expanding the middle class through transforming our workforce into technology-ready individuals. Okay, So our main speaker for this afternoon, no? Professor Schleicher, is already online. He would be delivering his presentation live from France. Very good. So while we're waiting, I just want to give some reminders regarding how our session would flow. So our presenters, no, our, our presenter will deliver his keynote presentation for us, and he would be given 30 minutes to do that. After that, I would be calling our distinguished panelists to share their feedback, their comments, and their reaction, their discussion on the presentation of our speaker. And then after that, I would be opening the floor for your questions, for discussion, as we highlight. We highlight the answers to the key questions that we have for this conference. Is that good? Okay, and then after this one, after this parallel session, we'll go back, to, we'll have a short. So when you ask your questions later, please don't forget to mention your name and your affiliation, and then please address, no? identify who among our panelists you would like to, to have your question answered. Okay. Okay, Professor Slicer, can you hear us? Hello and good afternoon. It's a pleasure to join you for the session on how we can build a future ready workforce. It's a tough question. You know, none of us can know the future. We do not even know what's going to happen tomorrow. Just think, you know, how a few years ago a, a tiny virus disrupted our lives, our education, our futures. Uh, we cannot, you know, imagine the future tomorrow, but we can ask ourselves, what are the drivers of this future? The, you know, big, you know, economic, social, demographic influences, and then ask ourselves, how could those drivers combine to shape and influence the future, and then develop different scenarios, different versions of the future? And the better we become at imagining different scenarios, the better we will be prepared for the future that eventually arrives. Because the future will always surprise us. Climate change is going to disrupt our lives a lot more than this uh, pandemic. Artificial intelligence puts to a test many of the assumptions that we have in education skills. We know how to educate second-class robots, you know, people who are very good at repeating what we told them. But, you know, what will, you know, make us human? How do we distinguish the human capabilities from the artificial intelligence we've created in our computers? That's the question that we need to answer. And then, you know, there are many other disruptors that we need to factor in when we think about a future-ready workforce. One thing is clear. We will need to strike a careful balance on the one hand, you know, Keeping this world in balance, the agenda of sustainability has never been as important as it is today, climate change, all of this. But we also need to enable people to live in a structurally imbalanced world, in a world where we can no longer learn for jobs because the jobs were changed, but where learning has become the work. So both of those dimensions are critically important. If you look at the world of work, what is very clear is that routine tasks are disappearing from our labor markets. That's what computers are so good at. No? The kind of things that are easy to teach and easy to test have also become easy to digitize, to, to automate. No? 
This world no longer rewards you just for what you know. No. Google knows everything. This reward, world rewards you for what you can do with what you know. And technology intensive tasks are on the rise. And then if you put those two factors together, you get a glimpse of the future of work. And now you can factor artificial intelligence into this picture. Now, I know, you know, we are all unhappy still with, you know, things like ChatGPT because, for example, they never tell us where they get the information from. They just throw an answer at you and leave you with that. Now. But, you know, that question of traceability is a matter of time. It's actually not in, in a flaw of the models underpinning artificial intelligence and large language model. It's simply, you know, that developers have been lazy to not build traceability into the application. Recording in progress. That will be solved uh, very, very soon. No. Accuracy, you know, as the training data expands of artificial intelligence, computers will become better, you know, in answering your questions, fact-checking, all of those. No. What we can also see that in the medium term, you know, uh, ChatGPT and its many friends are going to get better in interpreting your questions. No. Very clearly, as their training data expands, they will get a broader, you know, contextual understanding of your questions and then also adopt a more natural writing style. In the long term, you know, the big question is, how is technology going to deal with bias? Will artificial intelligence simply inherit human bias and then amplify it and accelerate it? Or will it, you know, develop something like intuition and, you know, be able to you know, think beyond its training data and help us reduce, moderate our own human biases. These are perhaps the more unanswered question. Uh, artificial intelligence could, today as a teacher can make your learning more scripted, more passive. You know, you just follow the dictates of some algorithms. You judge students on what happened to similar students in other contexts. Or will it super empower educators? to understand how different students learn differently, to imagine, to build scenarios, to personalize learning. On. And we do not know the answer to this, but we have to prepare ourselves for those different scenarios. So how do we prepare workforce for the future? Well, you know, every three years we conduct the global PISA assessments, the Philippines is a part of it, where we actually look at 15-year-olds, how well are young people at age 15 prepared for the world of tomorrow? Can they think creatively? Can they solve problems collaboratively? Can they think for themselves? Can they, you know, apply advanced knowledge in, in reading, in mathematics and science? And we take a special angle. We are asking less, you know, whether you remember a specific formula and equation in mathematics. We want you to be able to think like a mathematician. You know, it is not that important whether you can calculate an exponential function, but whether you can understand the concept, the idea of an exponential function. That is critically important today because, you know, phenomena like climate change or, you know, the evolution of a pandemic, they're all involving exponentials. Exponentials are something that is foreign to us humans. And it's not intuitive. We are born into a linear world. Time and space are all linear. Exponentials are challenging us, but if we have a deep understanding of mathematics, we can capture those wider phenomena. In science, we are less interested whether you can, you know, have specific knowledge in physics and chemistry, but we want to test whether you can think like a scientist. Can you design an experiment? Can you distinguish, you know, facts from fiction? Questions that are scientifically investigable from those that are not. So those things are really, really important. Well, let me share a few results with you. I will start with Japan. You know, when you look at the global PISA test every three years, mathematics, science, Japan always comes out very, very high among the OECD countries. Now. They get 10 out of 10 points in mathematics and science. The OECD only 7 out of 10. The OECD is the little uh, uh, blue dot. You know, that's the average of the industrialized countries. Now. But we should not be blinded. When we think of the world workforce of the future, we should not be blinded by just the academic outcomes. I'll give you some other measures from PISA, where Japan has a lot to learn. For example, you can see the dark yellow bar 
psychological well-being. Japanese students are not very happy. And in today's world, it's important for young people to have a sense of belonging, a sense of identity, a sense of joy, a sense of optimism. You don't see that among the Japanese 15-year-olds. You can see that Japanese 15-year-olds do not have much agency, the green bar. Why is agency important? Well, you know, the world does not reward passive consumers. The re world nowadays rewards people who can, you know, mobilize their cognitive, social, emotional resources. People who can do things, not just know things. Put ideas and knowledge into action. Be entrepreneurial, be inventive, imaginative. And you can see, in this case, Japanese are not as good as the OECD average. No? And then look at the next green bar, the light green bar, emotional resilience. No? Can you reimagine, can you reinvent yourself in the world of tomorrow, every day new? You know? Every day we wake up in a new world these days. We have to reimagine, reinvent ourselves. No? So all I wanted to say was tell you with this chat is that yes, academic uh, uh, knowledge is the cornerstone of schooling, but it is not enough to prepare a future ready workforce. We need to think beyond that in other dimensions. And if you think, well, this is only about Japan, it is actually not. You can pick another country, for example, here the United Kingdom. Not very different. You can see the British kids are a little bit less academically talented, you know, the yellow bar is shorter, but they're also not particularly happy. They don't show that much, you know, emotional resilience. What the British kids have, what the Japanese did not, was a bit more agency. No. They have learned how to do things. No. Because their schooling environment is often more project-oriented. Students are not just sitting in the classroom, they have to take responsibility for some of that. No. So you can see different education systems offer different strengths. And why is it important? Because it shows us we can change things. We can really do things. No. A lot of the extent to which we prepare a future ready workforce has a lot to do with what we do today. No. Well, you know, let's look at Colombia, South America. Isn't it interesting? You can see academically, Colombia is not that successful. No. You can see actually in the case of Colombia, you know, you can see, well, there is still a long way to go. But you can see Colombian kids are happy. They also show good levels of agency and engagement, high level of emotional resilience. So you can see a school system that does not look great by academic measures has actually some other strengths that in the 21st century will also be important. And finally, let me show you Denmark. That's actually really interesting where <clears throat> you can see actually Denmark is a country that is strong on everything good on academic performance, great on psychological well-being, very good on agency and engagement, good on resilience, also engagement for school. Danish kids love school. They're happy in school because school is something that offers them an interesting day. They have a strong set of social relationships, also very important. They're able to manage their own lives beyond school. They have a great openness to different perspectives, different ideas. And now, of course, you will ask yourself, where's the Philippines? And let me show you. This is the Philippines. You can see academically, the Philippines still has a very long way to go. It is just emerging as an education system, providing the kind of foundation skills. The yellow bar is quite short, but you know, actually, the country is doing quite well on psychological well-being. Kids in the Philippines have a sense of identity, a good sense of belonging. Uh, they actually feel, you know, joyful, optimistic in the future. And these things are very, very important. You can also see that display a good level of agency. You give them a problem, they can solve it. They can do things. Now. Very, very important in the world of today. Openness to diversity, a school leisure balance. Now. So there are some distinct strengths in the education systems which should not diminish when the education systems, you know, upgrades its academic abilities. Now, preparing young people for the future means really being good on all of those dimensions. Now, let me highlight a few aspects in a, in a little bit more detail. Now, 
uh, student sense of belonging. Now you can see, for example, in Austria and Switzerland, that is uh, very, very well developed. In the Philippines, still a long way to go. You can see growth mindset. In the world of today, the idea, the kind of mindset you have, how to overcome failure, is incredibly influenced and on upcome stuff. You can look, for example, Estonia on the right side. Now, students believe that, you know, if they invest effort, if they try hard, they're going to be successful. That's very, very important. That mindset that you cannot overcome difficulty, that success is not about the intelligence with which you were born with, now, which we see still dominant in the case of the Philippines. So, very, very important that education, building a workforce for tomorrow means also changing mindsets, not just building more knowledge. The question, of course, is, you know, how can you do that? And the first thought we always have is, well, we need money. And it's true. And you can see, particularly on the left side, uh, where you find countries like the Philippines, countries that do not invest that much on education, uh, investing more will likely get you better outcomes. Now, you can see the, the relationship between spending on the horizontal axis and performance of an education system on the vertical axis is quite steep at the left side of the chart. Now. But, you know, at some point, the relationship becomes weaker and weaker and weaker. And for example, Singapore and Qatar spend about the same, but Singapore is one of the world's best performing education systems, and Qatar is still a long way to go. You can look at Vietnam, you know, Vietnam is spending very little and still delivering very, very good outcomes. And that shows us that we need to think beyond money on this. The same is, you know, some people believe technology is going to change everything. But, you know, when you look at the relationship between the time that students spend on computers in school learning and learning outcomes, it's pretty flat. No? Some teachers do an amazing job in leveraging new technologies. And in other cases, you see much less of that. And what's also very clear is where students use technology for leisure. You know, they just, you know, you know, you use their, their smartphone for social media and so on. Their relationship is very, very negative. No? So it's there. We need to rethink how we build a workforce for the future that is technology, you know, able at the same time that is not, you know, becoming passive consumptive users of technology, but active creators you know, of content and knowledge. A future ready workforce also means that we need to enter into a culture of lifelong life right learning. If you think about the past, you know, you went to school, you went to university or vocational education, then you go into a job and one day you retire. Well, the future needs to look very, very different from that. Early childhood education and care is going to be much, much more important because that's where we learn some of the knowledge and skills that are most fundamental for our future. No? Empathy, creativity, social skills. No? They develop best in our earliest years of life. And then later in life, it's harder and harder. They become more personality traits. No? And then, you know, tertiary education needs to be much more transversal. And learning and working need to be much closer intertwined. No? Great, you know, uh, <clears throat> education systems are ones that enable people to upgrade, to upskill and reskill every day. And great people are going to invest and reinvest in their knowledge and skills. Always willing to learn, always willing to unlearn when the context change and relearn when new issues emerge. No? Easy to say, hard to do. Actually, when we survey people with our PISA for adults, uh, you could see a six in 10 adults in the OECD area did not participate in any form of adult learning. And when you ask them why, the most common answer is not, I got no chance, but I don't need it. The awareness that lifelong life by learning is the cornerstone for, you know, personal growth, for a future ready workforce is often insufficient, particularly among the ones who need that most. And I show you that on this slide. You can see people with advanced skills, now, reflected here in the, in, the, in, the, in the green bar, green dot dot, are much more likely to go back to learning than people who did not complete school. Now, this is one of the problems that we have, that those who need their lifelong learning most 
are usually the ones who participate least frequently because employers say, well, I'm not going to invest in those who didn't succeed in school. And people who did not succeed in school often, you know, were so disappointed they don't want to go back to school. And that highlights why it is so important to lay very, very strong foundations. When you ask yourself, you know, who is learning? Well, women are more common to engage in lifelong learning. No? They are more willing, more open to new worlds of learning. We can see younger people are more likely to engage in learning. You know, that's something we need to change, particularly in countries with uh, demography. We see, I told you already, people with advanced degrees are much more likely to go on learning than people who did not com complete school. No. And then, you know, not surprisingly, people who live in cities, who have, you know, great opportunities, also great opportunities to use their skills, are more likely to learn for themselves. Well, I want to show you one thing that, you know, is um, a little bit complicated uh, to explain, but incredibly important. Often we think that if you got a, you know, degree, a qualification, you are highly skilled. Well, it sometimes is the case, but not always. A qualification doesn't guarantee great skills. Conversely, people without formal qualifications can be extremely highly skilled. And our labor markets need to become more open to the skills of people, rewarding people for what they know and what they can do, rather than just, you know, for how they studied and what kind of programs they completed. Often, there is too much credentialism, too much, you know, attention to formal qualifications. No. You know, take me as an example. You know, I'm a graduate in physics many years ago. No. If you put me in a laboratory today, I'm probably not going to be very successful because the world of physics has changed so much. And because, you know, at the same time, I learned many things that are not, you know, visible in my degree. No. I'd work in education today. No. We need to become more open, more sensitive to the knowledge and skills of people, and also across countries. You can see here a Japanese high school graduate has better literacy and numeracy skills than a university graduate in many other countries. So we need to be much, become much better in rewarding and recognizing the skills of people rather than just looking at the formal qualifications. We also need to see how this change across generations. One of the skills that you absolutely need in a future ready workforce is the digital skills, the skills to manage complex digital information. If you look among older people, 55 to 65 year olds, you can see it's only about, you know, one in 10, sometimes one in 20, who are reasonably skilled now. That's the length of the green button. Now you will tell me, well, that's all soft in the young generation. Younger people are more highly skilled and more technologically literate. And yes, that is true on average, but you can see even among the young people, only about 50% of people are, you know, able to use technologies to solve today's problems. In most countries, a lot of young people are not future ready, even on something as essential as technology. We can also see how the relative position of countries has changed. No? In the past, the United States used to be at the frontier. Tonight, today, the United States is only an average performer. No? Not because things got worse in the United States, because other countries have made so much more progress. You can look at Singapore, no? one of the lowest performers in the past, now at the top, you know, just close behind Finland and Sweden. No? And that is also an important message is that, you know, success is never forever. The world can change incredibly fast. And education systems that invest in their future will change the future. Very clearly, this world is no longer divided between rich and well-educated nations and poor and badly educated ones. You can see a country like Vietnam. You know, 10, 15 years ago, who would have looked to Vietnam in terms of education? Today, they actually, you know, compare with countries like France, Germany, or many dimensions. So, again, the countries that build a strong foundation for their future by equipping people with the right knowledge, skills, but also attitudes and values, they lay the foundations for a future ready workforce. Thank you very much. Okay.
Thank you, Professor Schleicher, for that informative presentation with the data from PISA that you presented to us, highlighting approaches on how to build a future-ready workforce from the lens of PISA and OECD. So one of the salient features no, of that presentation is that a degree is not a guarantee for, for skills and that we need to learn to do the work, no? Le learn to do the work as a new skill in this new period. Now, to build on Professor Schleicher's presentation and discussion, we bring the discourse to the local level. Okay, And at this point, it's my honor to introduce our distinguished discussants to share their insights and perspectives on our topic, anchored on their professional and personal experiences here in the Philippines, with emphasis on interventions towards expanding the middle class. And on that note, I would like to formally introduce to you our first discussant. I would like to call on Dr. Michael M. Alba, He's the president of the FEU Public Policy Center. Dr. Alba served as university president of FEU from October 2012 to July 2023 and as trustee from October 2012 to present. And he obtained his AB Economics degree from the Ateneo de Manila University, MA Economics degree from the University of the Philippines de Liman, School of Economics, and PhD Applied Economics degree from Stanford University. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Michael Alba. Dr. Alba. So I have a... I, have, I, pre I made my own uh, PowerPoint. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'll just sit. No? Thank you to PIDS and the organizers of the 10th Annual Public Policy Conference, and this session in particular, for inviting me to take a small part in the proceedings. On behalf of all of us here, and indeed of all Filipinos, I thank Professor Andrea Schleicher for his insightful, thought-provoking presentation on building a future-ready workforce. We should take the ideas he has shared with us very seriously and build on them for the good of our country. Next slide, please. Okay. Which is why, aside from a few questions on two slides, my comments go beyond his presentation to one, provide added context, two, draw out some implications, what the challenges are, as it were, of improving our education system from the perspective of the proverbial social planner in welfare economics, and three, end with a pitch for PISA for schools. So my first slide three, please. Yeah, so my first uh, nitpicking questions. First, my nit nitpicking questions. Next slide. So slide 14 of the presentation summarizes the PISA results for the Philippines. And it indicates that Filipino students ranked higher than the OECD average in agency and engagement. I don't find this credible because anecdotal evidence suggests that in general, Filipino students are passive recipients of instruction and do not exercise agency. Moreover, how are Filipino students engaged when they feel a poor sense of belonging in their schools, as shown on slide 15, and they lack resilience, as shown here? These contrasting findings seem inconsistent to me. So how, how may they be resolved? Next slide. Then slide 18, which shows the relationship between math performance and time spent on digital devices in school, seems all alright. Why is math performance higher among students who use digital devices for leisure for zero hours? than among students who use the devices for learning for zero hours. Is it the case that a group with zero hours for leisure 
include students with zero hours for both leisure and learning, as well as those with zero hours for leisure but positive hours for learning. If so, the reason for the higher interest value of the group with zero hours for leisure may be that the group includes students with positive hours for learning. And the lower intercept value of the group with zero hours for learning includes students with positive hours uh, for leisure. Slide six, uh, next slide please. So for a better analysis, shouldn't the two variables of interest be taken as a bivariate random variable x, y, where x stands for hours for leisure and y for hours for learning? And the group and the students can then be stratified into four groups as shown in the table. Next slide. Second, the added national context. Here I would like to point out that it is urgently important that we take the education challenge at this time very seriously so that we can maximize our demographic dividend. Allow me to explain this at length. So next slide. As shown in the figure, the country's dependency ratio, the green line, has been declining. Calculated as a young and elderly population divided by the working age population, this ratio is a social security overlapping generations indicator that tracks how many young and old dependents each Filipino of working age has to support on average. Peaking at 1.036 in 1961 and 62, estimated at 0.549 in 2024, and projected to reach its trough at 0.5116 in 2050 and 2051, the ratio values imply that the social security burden of the Filipino worker has been easing in the last 60 years. Whereas in the 1960s, each worker had to support about one dependent, as of the mid-2020s until midway through the 21st century, he or she would only do so for slightly more than half a dependent. In other words, with fewer household members to support on average, family breadwinners at this time need not allocate as much of their incomes on consumption as their counterparts did in the 1960s. They can save more of their incomes and accumulate wealth. With the higher household saving, saving rates, the Philippines in turn has the opportunity it never has had to make judicious investments that would solve our social coordination problems, expand our productive capacity, and thereby push the country's living standards to a higher authority, a higher trajectory. In the figure, the living standard, the red line, is quantified as the as the gr real gross domestic product valued in chain 2017 purchasing power parity US dollars divided by the total population. In other words, the living standard measures each Filipino share in the country's economic pie. In part because of the country's past social security burden between 1950 and 2010, its living standard only modestly increased by 2.1% per year. But between 2010, well, I'm going to exceed, 2010 and 2019, the Philippine living standard grew by 3.7% per year, although it was set back by the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020. If the Philippines can grow its living standard by 4% per year from 2023 onward, which is the red dashed line, by 2050, the country's standard of living will be almost 25,000 US dollars, meaning that the Philippines would have joined the rich nations of the world. This is the prospect of our demographic dividend. But this prospect may be a one-time chance only. Note in the figure that beyond 2050, the dependency ratio is projected to rise which will make the social security burden of families heavier once again. In other words, the, the Philippines currently has only a quarter century window to cross over from middle income to rich nation status. Another window is unlikely to open in the next 100 years. Next slide. How is the demographic dividend related to education? 
Ultimately, the maximization of our demographic dividend depends on a Filipino workforce that is fully employed because globally competitive, in particular adept at navigating and adapting to the disruptive technology-driven world of the 21st century. Absent this boost in productive cap capability, working age Filipinos would be a consumption drag on the economy and economic growth. For this reason, it behooves the Philippine education sector to be intentional about developing in their students values, big picture perspectives, and the necessary work and life skills, particularly the transversal skills, to thrive in the future that is fast approaching. This education angle of the demographic dividend has a socioeconomic distribution dimension. Socioeconomic class D families comprise the largest segment of this distribution at 60%. So the key education question of the demographic dividend redounds to how may quality education be delivered at a price point that SECD families can afford? This is a question, the answer to which economic and education policymakers must figure out, which unfortunately the DepEd has not. Otherwise, we would not be in the long-running learning crisis that the country is in. Next slide. This leads to my third cons concern. Arguably, the most important challenge on this problem is, how do we take forward Professor Schleiser's insights to develop a globally competitive workforce? Next slide. Or rephrasing this question more generally in economic terms, how should Philippine education sector be organized such that its institutions and incentive structures are aligned with the achievement of the societal goals for which education is both a means and an end. As he is trained to do, I think an economist would go about answering this question by considering himself as a social planner who wants to maximize social welfare, most probably in utilitarian terms. Next slide. He would start with the following stylized facts about Philippine education. First, the societal goals of education are to A, develop the country's human capital to make the Filipino workforce globally competitive and future-proof against the technological and disruptive uh, and the other disruptions of the 21st century. B, transmit Filipino culture, values, history, identity to the next generation to ensure the cohesion of Philippine society and inculcate love of country. Next slide. The sectoral welfare economics objectives of education are to improve A, access to education in general, and schooling in particular. B, operational efficiency in, in, school, operation, in school administration. C, Distribu distributional equity of schooling opportunities, and D, education quality and learning outcomes and student success. S next slide. The additional roles, societal roles that higher education institutions are expected to perform are A, to confer academic degrees that certify that graduates have the life skills and are prepared for the world of work. B, conduct research to push the boundaries of knowledge since HEIs are a society's primary repositories of knowledge, and C, enhance the economic prospects of its geographic area, not least by taking on the most challenging social problems, since HEIs have the widest and the deepest intellectual resources. Next slide. There's wide diversity in local conditions and specific missions, so that a one-size-fits-all policy and administrative framework will not work. Next slide. Uh, market failures are rife in education. So education, first of all, education is, not, is a club good, not a public good, because its benefits are excludable and rival. A school can restrict entry into its campus and its program offerings, which is excludability. But barring congestions, um, registered, registered students may simultaneously attend the same lecture, learn from the same assigned homework, use school facilities like the library, gym, and laboratories, which is non-rivalry. Next slide. Education has external and spillover effects. It is believed that educated people are more engaged and civically responsible uh, citizens. A school also has 
a natural monopoly cost st structure. Its up upfront costs are very large in proportion to total cost. So to set up a campus, a school has to develop relatively large, a relatively large tract of land on which buildings with classrooms, laboratories, other facilities, offices, have to be constructed and maintained along with other physical infrastructure such as the internet backbone, roads and foot traffic pathways, parking spaces, water services, and so forth. So at low student population levels, variable costs that depend on enrollment such as faculty size are minuscule relative to the initial fixed costs. Education is also uh, rife with information, beset with information asymmetry. So we know, we all know that education financing has to deal with moral hazard and adverse election problems. And education is an experienced good. Schools know the value of the, schools know the value proposition and the transformation process better than, uh, better than, than their prospective students. The quality of a student's transformation journey is only gradually revealed to the student as she goes through or even after the schooling process. Significantly, the quality of the transformation journey depends on how immersed in and engaged with the school's curricular and co-curricular activities a student is. So from these stylized facts, the social planner would then go about setting the right incentive design. And there really is much, much, much more to say on this, but you get the gist of, about the complexity of the endeavor. So I will stop here. My fourth and last point, um, next slide is a shout out to PISA. No? As a nation, we have not really engaged with the wealth of data that is in PISA. I think the DepEd should have contracted PIDS to scar through the PISA data sets to explore what we can learn from them. Uh, next slide. Next slide. So, which is why Okay, so which is why I hope you will support the initiative that Far Eastern University is undertaking to become the national service provider for PISA for schools. Uh, next slide. Okay, so that we can do these things. So again, I, thank, I, I know I've overstepped my time limit. Um, again, thank you to the organizers for this conference and this session. Thank you to Professor Schleicher for shining a light on this very challenging issue. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Alba. Actually, your nitpicking questions are actually thought-provoking questions to look at the PISA results in a different lens. And then also your prospects of the demographic dividend gives us a heads up on how to manage it. And regarding the DepEd and PIDS, our president, Dr. Orbeta, is here now with us. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Alba, for that. And we would now proceed. Just keep your burning questions there. We will open the floor later on for further questions. But I would like to call on our second panelist, Dr. Winston Conrad B. Padohinog, who is the president of the University of Asia and the Pacific. Dr. Padohinog sits on the board of non-government organizations that promote good governance and education for the less privileged. He is a member of CSR Philippines, a tax advocacy group, and the Center for Excellence in Governance, an umbrella organization of four important governance undertakings. The Institute of Solidarity in Asia, the Institute of Corporate Directors, the Center of Family Governance, and the Center for School Governance. Dr. Padohinog earned his Bachelor of Arts degree with double major in Economics and Management from the University of the Philippines, Visayas. He also earned his Master's degree in Industrial Economics from the Center for Research and Communication, the forerunner of UA and P. And he obtained his Doctor of Business Administration degree from De La Salle University. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Winston Padohinog. Thank you very much. I would like to uh, thank uh, Dr. Schleiser for those very deep uh, insights uh, regarding the role of education. 
and making ready our workforce. And also, I would like to thank PIDS for inviting me in this uh, very important exercise. Well, I think I believe it is strategic to work given the results of uh, PISA. Sometimes we get overwhelmed by it. But I would like to focus more on to move to the, to the future, the current needs of the workforce, and there later with implications of technological change. No? Otherwise, we will end up neglecting both the current needs and the future requirements of the nation given the changes that we foresee in technology. The best step forward is to look at the immediate needs of our economy, which if you examine very closely, it, in my opinion, is not at the moment really in need of a good PISA result. The ones captured by PISA are the needs for me for the fourth industrial revolution, such as science, math, communication, which I believe are also equally important in the future. But we are yet here, we're not even yet achieving what we call the third industrial revolution stage. We must navigate first the short term before we take on the long term. First, I have, four, I have five items here, dealing with the current skills and talent shortage of our nation. Key shortages in skills and workforce is important to support the present needs of our growing economy and population of our current programs and projects. For example, we are in need of construction workers and equipment operators, healthcare providers, cybersecurity experts, even the basic the needs of, me. of our KPO sector, such as the ability to communicate, to work as a team, to solve problems. Our current economy needs a lot of accountants, logistics, science and math teachers, etc. Second, I think we need to develop in such a short term the capabilities of our current workforce. No? The importance of upskilling, reskilling, and retooling of the labor force, like the executives and the middle executives of the faculty and academic administrators, the current, the current skill, skill of skilled workers. No? The rapid pace of technological change requires a strong emphasis on short term, non degree education and training investments in digital literacy, technical skills, and continuous learning opportunities will be essential to prepare the current labor, labor pool for their future roles in industries that is in need, we need right now. Third, I think the importance of collaborative partnerships. No? Academic industry partnerships can play pivotal roles in developing relevant training programs that align with the needs of our economy and our industry. Companies can support, for example, the training initiatives, provide apprenticeships, and even offer mentorship to bridge the skills gap. For instance, like the research of what we have seen presented there by uh, Professor Alba, the research work of the academe, on the other hand, can be directed to also respond to the needs of our policymakers, to the industry, give it impetus and offer creative and practical and viable ideas. Fourth, I think the importance of balancing automation and employment by looking at the trends presented, of course, as we have seen here on the slides. For example, we need to identify emerging and vanishing roles in work. While automation may replace some jobs, it will also create new ones, especially in highly digitized fields. The focus should be on transitioning our workers now into emerging sectors such as renewable energy, disaster management and resilience, digital services, advanced manufacturing, remote health care, or even the capacity to teach and deliver blended or hybrid, hybrid learning and teaching data protection, and privacy, and cybersecurity. Of course, in this changing environment, I think we need to provide also some degree of holistic support to our labor force, specifically mental health support. Technological change can be disruptive and stressful. Preparing the present and the future workforce, how to manage social media, for example, will be a key. Professions founded on the humanities, I have to say, 
as presented, I think, earlier, such as humanities, arts, literature, and philosophy, are essential for ensuring the humanity of persons and the humaneness of work, providing access to mental health resources and creating a supportive work environment, for example, that is geared towards holistic development, will help workers adapt and thrive in these changing conditions. Fifth, educational reform and lifelong learning. We need to review, as educators, our curriculum, the modernization and alignment of our uh, delivery. Education systems, both degree and non-degree, should be updated to focus not only on technical skills, but also on other soft skills like critical thinking, creativity, problem solving, capacity to work with others, etc. Here we should also emphasize the importance of, in education of STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And the lifelong learning culture is important. Promoting a culture of lifelong learning where individuals are encouraged and supported to continuously upgrade their skills will be crucial to staying competitive in a technology-driven world. And finally, for government's role, the policy framework. The government should create a comprehensive policy framework that supports innovation and flexibility for the education sector to respond to the needs of the labor force. Rather than to regulate, it should encourage prudential view of policy, allowing for flexibility and room for outcome-based consultative workshops. This includes providing resources for the most vulnerable and even marginalized sectors, implementing responsive and competitive labor market regulations, considering that the Philippine labor pool will have to compete now with other countries and support small and medium enterprises in adopting new technologies. And finally, public awareness and community engagement. I think we need to raise public awareness about the impact of technological change and engaging communities in dialogue will ensure that the transition to a digital economy is inclusive and beneficial to all. So overall, the Philippines, I think I, think I share with the view of Professor Alba, actually stands at the crossroad where it can exploit its demographic dividend, where strategic planning and proactive measures can ensure that the technological advancements lead to greater prosperity and social progress for everyone. By focusing on both the development of skill and knowledge and worker protection, the country can harness the benefits of the digital age while uh, safeguarding the welfare of its workforce. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Padohinog. And just like to highlight your statement on navigating short term first before long term is tantamount to navigating first what we can manage, right? So that we can introduce change and intervention that will give us full leverage. Also, the importance of academic, academic research and policy, highlighting the role of PIDS as a policy research, right? And in supporting the country's reform agenda. Also, in terms of lifelong learning, appealing to the presentation earlier of Professor, Professor Schleicher about the need to learn to do the work is not anymore the trend, but rather it is learning. Learning is already the work that we're doing in, this, in the 21st century. So moving forward, I would like to call on our third discussant. Mr. Victor Mari Sibagilla Jr. is a multidisciplinary artist and designer who is one of the 10 outstanding young men of, for 2022 and a Ramon V. Del Rosario C. Club awardee for 2024 for Impact Entrepreneurship. Currently, he is the CEO and Creative Director of Kandama Social Enterprise, which is a fashion social enterprise that provides economic opportunities to indigenous women, preserves the tradition of handloom weaving, and helps the community protect the environment that sustains the rice terraces specifically in Jelongan Village in Kiangan, Ifugao. He graduated from De La Salle University, Manila, and completed a master's degree in development management at the Asian Institute of Management, where he graduated valedictorian with high distinction. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Bagillat Jr. Sir, the floor is yours. 
Thank you, uh, Dr. Rivera, my former professor at Asian Institute of Management. I'd like to thank PIDS2 for having me. Um, in behalf of the indigenous communities, specifically in Hulongan Village, and by an extension, um, in behalf of uh, the indigenous communities in the country. So this is my presentation. It's about leading from the future, a generative um, approach to ensuring a future-ready workforce, specifically in Hulongan Village. So this might be true for our community, but it might not be the case in other um, indigenous communities. But the framework that we used are actually um, and very much applicable pretty much to a lot of um, other ethno-linguistic groups, okay? So the area, the challenge that we wanted to deal with is how do we ensure the future readiness of the workforce specifically in Hulongan village? And it's a very nuanced um, characteristic, largely because this is next to a UNESCO heritage site. At the same time, it's also next to a watershed. So we can't just introduce any technology there, or we can't just introduce any industry, right? Um, and any careers, right? They can't just be like lawyers in an area, etc. But at the same time, we have to make sure that there should be people in the area to tend to the rice terraces, but the, the practices shouldn't be disruptive um, or should not dis destroy the rice terraces as well as the, um, the watershed. And the problem is, the income there is not high enough if they're going to rely to agriculture, to tending to the rice terraces, right? So a lot of the locals in Hulongan village, um, by the way, I have a, a indigenous heritage, so I'm generally, my family is generally from the area. Um, a lot of them would clear the rainforest to pave way for commercial gardening so that they can actually, you know, uh, trade and um, increase their income. And the problem with clearing the rainforest is that, um, of course, it's a, it's a watershed, so it's, it could be very problematic, right? It's the reason why there's a lot of flooding around the areas, okay? So this is a research that we've done at the AAM. You can also read that uh, online, moving on to the next part. So at the end of the day, the problem that we wanted to solve was, how do we eliminate poverty within the area and uh, eliminate it in a way that's not very destructive of the environment. So this is our logic model for the social enterprise. It looks very linear, but it's so actually there's, it's very complicated at the same time, right? But to a certain extent, we think that this logic model is also has a lot of limitations in itself. Um, if you work with the NG, with NGOs or if you work with grant giving bodies, logic model is very important. Let's move on to the next part. So what we need is a different kind of technology or social technology to be able to address the complexity that we're dealing with um, on the ground. So these are the different types of complexity that we're most likely aware with. So the first type is the dynamic complexity, which is about the cause and effect are distant in space and time. So you have things like SDG, for example, that addresses that kind of uh, dynamic complexity. And then you also have social complexity, which is about actors having different views and interests to address a particular challenge. So you have a multi-stakeholder approach, right, which is very popular actually in a lot of um, government work. But one of the things that we have to look at, into as well is the complexity in terms of the generative complexity, right, which is about the disruptive patterns of innovation and change. And the thing about this kind of complexity is that solutions are not known. These are problems that just occurred as of the moment, and nobody has actually um, seen that in the past. Like, for example, the pandemic, right? So I agree with the Dr. Slicer that there's a lot of, that we can't really tell uh, what the future would hold because of the generative complexity. So for dynamic complexity, you have a whole system approach. For social complexity, you have a multi-stakeholder approach. But for generative complexity, the kind of approach that we use is a sensing and presencing approach, something that we've actually used uh, in our social enterprise. So for the first two, the whole system and the multi-stakeholder approach, we use that in, in uh, generating the logic model, but we think that it's not enough for us to just rely on those two approaches to solve um, poverty on the ground. So let's take a look at the sensing and the presencing approach more. By looking at the two sources of learning, how do we really learn? How do we plan and solve um, development concerns? The first one is by looking at learning by reflecting on the experiences of the, of the past. The useful, let's act, let's observe, 
Let, let's reflect, let's plan, let's act. That's how you generally create, you know, like your plan for one year for corporations or for organizations. But the second type of learning, which oftentimes is, is actually overlooked, is learning from the future as it emerges, uh, emerges or presencing, where you do two things. First, it's sensing, where you connect first to the highest feature potential or possibility. And the second one is presencing, which is bringing the future into the now. Now, the thing about this is that maybe logically, it's kind of hard to understand, right? But that's the reason why, uh, because nobody knows what the future is. So there's a very spiritual component behind this. And that's also the reason why it, um, it resonates largely to a lot of indigenous communities. Because the way in which they operate is also very different. It's not like, you know, the like academe, for example, wherein everything has to be measured or has to be quantitative. But it has to be supplemented by this kind of, um, of approach. Okay, let's move on to the next part. Okay, so the reason why this is particularly um, important is because in terms of respond responding to change, it's in the lower, the deeper level of responding to the problem. So the first part is when there's a problem or a change that you're addressing, you introduce quick fixes. Like there's trash on the sea, uh, so, uh, by the bay, what do you do? Pour sand. <laughs> or probably um, weavers not having enough income, you just buy from the weavers. So those are the quick fix uh, solutions. Um, the second one is a deeper way of uh, responding to it, but which is still lacking. It's just coming up with policies. Like for example, uh, if there's a deforestation problem, then simply ban it. If weavers don't have enough income, then what they're doing in, in Indonesia, let's just introduce, uh, let's force our um, government officials to wear batik every Mondays, right? So that's the that's kind of a, of a policy that's second level. But the third level of approach is changing mindsets. And I think this is something that also resonates with me is what the Dr. Slicer uh, mentioned earlier. You have to change the way by which you view things you change the value system in order for you to address the problem at its very root. That's the reason why indigenous communities, for example, are better stewards of the environment compared to any national government agency because of the way by which they view the environment as something that's very intimate to them. It's a mindset itself. So their view is from an ego system or anthropomorphic um, view of protecting the environment to something that's more ecocentric, where humans are not at the center of uh, environmental stewardship, but just simply part of the ecosystem. So it's also the same thing with weaving. So we have to change the views of weavers that they're weaving simply because they have to tend to their families, or they're weaving simply because they have to earn income. The way by which we're changing it is that we're making them think or believe that they're doing it for their um, ancestors, because they're cultural bearers, because they're national treasures, because they're actually creating piece of art, pieces of art and heritage. And that's also where regenerating um, comes in, where the intention and the attention is actually on a deeper, more spiritual level compared to the practical level that's, that was, um, uh, or something that's just about money, okay? Next slide. So this is the first type of learning that we did. We, obviously, it's multi-stakeholder. We talked to the people in the community, the different um, uh, LGU, and, um, state agencies, etc. But this is what learning from the future for us actually means. So we sense we're connecting to the higher, highest future possibilities. We imagined weaves being showcased as a couture piece rather than as simply table runners. So at the time in 2017, you know, um, Ifugo Weaves has never been to the, the Eiffel Tower, or it has never been viewed as a couture piece. So we brought it to different countries, the most recent one in, in Seoul, we brought it to Cannes Film Festival, so on and so forth. Um, so we connected Ifugo Weavers to a global marketplace. So now it's easier for Ifugo Weavers to think of themselves as culture bearers rather than simply workers who make weaves. Okay, moving on. But like, of course, it's a, it's a constant thing. Um, we're constantly pre presencing. Future will always have a, 
have a lot of its, of its challenges. The important part is to have a framework on how to deal with challenges. So currently, what we're doing is we're prototyping something that's new. And the vision from the community and from different stakeholders too is to become a, a premier sustainable tourism site. So what we're doing is, next slide please. So what we're doing is we're connecting sustainable fashion with, the, with sustainable tourism. So every time we do a show, for example, in New York, or we do a show in Paris, we want to bring them to the community so that they'll be able to experience life there and how the, the, the fabrics are actually made. Instead of simply bringing the weaves to other parts of the world, what we want to do is to also bring the world to our community in Halongan Village and still, of course, practice sustainable tourism. So it's still, it's, it's a prototype, but we hope it's a, it's a, it will work. Um, but we have to constantly iterate on this one. But the thing is that this is what the future looks like, a future-ready um, workforce looks like, looks like for us, where we upscale our weavers as tourist, tourist guides, homestay, own, so homestay owners, etc. Okay, so I want to leave you with this very important um, statement, which is, okay, let's move on. The success of any intervention depends on the interior condition of the intervener. So whatever the intervention is, you always have to look at the quality of the attention and the quality of the intention of the person who is actually intervening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Bagillet, for that presentation. So thank you for introducing to us two alternative approaches, such as your social technology, the whole system approach, the sensing and pre-sensing approach, and the multi-stakeholder. I had to enumerate that because the literature, a lot of literature has emphasized that a linear thinking approach to solving poverty, to expanding the middle class, may be, remains to be challenging because it may not be an appropriate approach. So the approaches that Mr. Baguillet has mentioned earlier, studies could explore, can probe on the effectiveness of those approach as an alternative lens to solving the problems of poverty and then middle class expansion and so on. Thank you very much for that. Now, I do have burning questions for them, but I would like to open the floor to our audience, our participants. If you have burning questions, please do approach the microphone, identify yourself, and address the question to the panelists. And may I request our panelists, Dr. Alba, Dr. Padohinog, and Mr. Bagiliat, to please occupy the seats in front. I think our first question would be for from Sir Vic, please. Thank you. Um, I have um, one comment and a, a question. I think that um, uh, Dr. Pa uh, Mr. Padulina. Uh, Dr. Padulino, um, basically uh, calls for addressing first or prioritizing short-term issues or problems or challenges. Um, I want to put that in perspective, I think, uh, because um, for decades now, um, our policymakers, especially politicians, have been actually focused on short-term solutions to the point that our policy making can be characterized as sulong urong, sulong urong, and this is an approach that basically, um, shall we say, do not accumulate into something that in the long run improves the systems towards the trajectory where you want it to be in the future. So I think you really have to balance the short term, short -term. and the long term. Um, 
Marami example dyan. Hindi ko na i-mention dyan. Um, now, this question is uh, addressed to uh, Dr. Slicer. Um, I think we now recognize the uh, critical importance of the growth mindset factor and the formation of uh, socio-emotional skills like grit, uh, diligence, uh, and so on. Um, the uh, question that they have, which is a, a, a practical question, is how do we form those non-cognitive skills or competencies? Um, and who should be responsible for them? Who should be held to account for them? And also uh, that there's a challenge, this challenge is that in the context of at least the Philippines, is that uh, our teachers and our curriculum, our teachers are so busy already with what they've got without even dealing with this um, uh, non-cognitive issues. Um, and at the same time, our curriculum is admittedly highly congested. As um, a former secretary, Armin, um, in my conversation with him when he was secretary of education, mentioned, we don't have the time in the, in, anymore to deal with this uh, social emotional uh, competencies, uh, this growth mindset, and so on. So my question to Dr. Slicer, um, you know, is how do other countries do it? And, and how can uh, we do it in the Philippines in order to promote this very critical, critically important um, competencies that we need to develop? Okay, thank you. So may I ask first our panelists to respond to that? Thank you very much for that comment. Uh, sir, um, I agree, as they said, that uh, the first day of, during the first day of office of our politicians, the, th the next thing that they have in mind is the next election. <laughs> and I, sh I agree with you, too. I think uh, I would like to dwell more on your question about the non-cognitive aspect. And I think many of our educational institutions have fallen into the trap of too much specialization, which, uh, which breed knowledge that uh, may necessarily not be relevant later in the future. But what has been presented earlier by Professor Schleiser was, as you have called them, non-cognitive, or I refer to them as the soft skills. Our curriculum has been devoid, as I have mentioned earlier, by the, the need for the liberal education. We have stripped our curriculum uh, and replaced it with too much uh, specialization and too much uh, uh, what we call uh, societal objective type of uh, lesson. What do I mean? We have removed, for example, a large portion, a chunk in our curriculum. History is very important. Even the study of arts the literature and the philosophy. Those are the kind of foundation that our students, students need in order to be a creative thinker, a critical thinker, uh, someone who can go and look into his humanity and the humanity of another person. That's the course that where you can work as a team uh, and you can also solve problems by learning, for example, what happened in history. I think we have we have neglected that, no? and with that, I think that's the reason why uh, our labor force, in my theory, has been 
very, very inflexible and immediately adjusting to the needs of those non-cognitive component of our uh, of uh, of the future workforce. So that's my my take. Maybe my colleagues here will have another uh, view on on the issue. I think one of the questions is something to do with who should be in charge of non-cognitive um, learning for, for kids or teaching non-cognitive skills, given that DevEd is too busy. Um, I, I'd love to think that, again, it has to be a multi-stakeholder approach, right? not just government, but other kinds of um, agencies or, or organizations. So one of which is our, our social enterprises, other than NGOs. So I started a social enterprise because it was a product of my thesis back in college in the LSU, which, uh, and my thesis is about how training women or investing in the education of women has the highest return of investment to community development. So because of that learning, I brought it till, till after I graduated and then I started my own social enterprises. Um, I got lucky that the Singapore Foundation helped me gave me like technical assistance in building uh, the social enterprise, which also um, tries to address the education of women um, and to teach them other skills that are very per that are particular pertinent to uh, to Hulongan village, right? Like uh, weaving, um, how to greet, how to entertain guests, or how to handle or manage uh, homestays, etc. So I think that would be a good uh, shout out to all other uh, institutions too. Um, I'm, I'm very thankful that DLSU has a program where they encourage uh, the young ones to to think of projects or programs that could help um, women in the community. But at the same time, I think NGOs and international organizations could also do more in terms of funding or helping create these kinds of social enterprises. Thank you. So, so I really don't know how how we teach our students uh, the non-cognitive skills, but um, so maybe the answer the answer. So I don't I don't know the international experience, uh, which is uh, Vic's question, but uh, you know it, what what was raised in my mind was why are we in all why why do we have such a big international workforce? Why do we have OFWs who thrive in all countries of the world? And I think, I think we're really good at socialization. Uh, we, we have resilience, although maybe they're not taught in schools. So, so maybe, maybe the answer is that we should have more, we should bring, I, I'm a big proponent of school-based management. Um, it used to be a long time ago so, so this is the other problem that I was not able to uh, relate. No, our problem is we're not holding to account each administration on the societal goals and objectives of education. So, what happened? Because there is no expressed goal that they need to that they need to pay attention to. Instead, they create they. The immediate, the, the knee-jerk reaction is each administration that comes in wants to create its own legacy. And so there's always the urong sulong that every, every new administration will not accept the previous administration's progress. But what we need to do is change that mindset and to say, whatever you do, let's just you know, focus on, this group, on, on the societal goals. And we have indicators for these, including maybe cognitive skills. And the, the fact that we have not changed the cent very highly centralized administration of the DepEd really is really poor service for the country. There's so many local conditions that are very different. And you cannot have Manila dictate. I mean, which is why you have to, have, you have to bring back school-based management. Let the locals, let the principal organize the resources in the local community for the benefit of the schools. Okay, thank you. So I think we know we're, ad, prof, unfortunately, Professor Slicer has been disconnected. Yeah, he had to, yeah, he had to, he had to leave. But anyway, so we're going on to the discussion of balancing technical skills with, with the human skills in order for our students, our workforce, 
to be ready not only with the technology but also in terms of interaction with other workers. There's a hand there, please. Uh, I'm Merwin Salazar from the Senate Economic Planning Office. My question is related to the demographic dividend, which, which was mentioned by uh, Dr. Slicer and Dr. Alba. Um, data, present data show that we, the Philippines uh, has low labor force participation, both for male and female, compared to other countries in Southeast Asia, in Asia, in other parts of the world. Um, I agree with you that education is um, a critical factor in, in, in pursuing, you know, reaping or maximizing demographic dividend. But there are many other factors um, identified in many studies um, in the Philippines, um, particularly to um, uh, both economic, social, and cultural factors. And I'd like to cite for a particular um, instance uh, for low female labor force participation. Uh, despite a uh, female having relatively higher uh, number of graduates in secondary and in tertiary compared to males. So um, female uh, usually are naturally assigned the, the care uh, giving services at home. And that's one of the factors mentioned in many studies. But um, aside, f aside from that, um, um, would you, in your study or in your readings, um, uh, have you come up with uh, recommendations, policy recommendations, on how to hurdle this particular issue to be able, that particular issue of low labor force participation is really critical for us. It's even called, if we are able to hurdle that, we can achieve gender dividend. That's, per, uh, that's a, a critical to uh, maximizing demographic dividend for the Philippines. So um, my question is, do you have uh, specific uh, recommendations in your study on how to address this particular issue? Thank you. So that, that's a very hard question to answer. I, I don't know that uh, I have all the answers. But um, first, um, just on the, on the, how do you say, the, the low uh, labor force participation rate, could it be that education is still the answer in that uh, there is low quality, most of the, you know, the, the most of the, I guess we don't, we don't measure the quality of learning outcomes. And so if, if the labor for, or the workers are not product, productive to begin with, how can they become employable? I mean, the, the anecdote is that, um, um, industries still bewail the you know the the gap in skills of so so I mean the 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 anecdotal evidence suggests that for instance engineers who graduate even from UP and I I participated in studies on this uh, engineers who graduate even from UP need two years of being acclimatized in their new Japanese companies before they can become really productive. So why is, that, why is there that learning gap between the skills of the graduates and the skills needed by the workforce? That's, that's one. Then there, in my study on the gender wage differentials a long time ago, uh, a problem, so you mentioned the pro a problem that, that still remains is that uh, there's a gender bias in uh, household chores that that men when they go home are couch potatoes or they spend some of their hard earned income on vices uh, so if we so so the quality of the you know the the work that's done at home really depends on how good the woman is if you give the if you give the opportunities to women, uh, it re it flows down to the children more than if you give the work benefits to the men. Um, there's also the cultural thing about you know married women are not expected also to work. So there's very low. If you if you divide the if you divide the workers into single males, single females. Married, married males, married females, 
the highest earners are the married males. Maybe because the the um, firms see them as the most stable workers. Married females are not highly valued because probably probably what's being factored in is that they'll get pregnant, they're not going to stay with you. Um, anyway, so and, and actually the least valued workers are the are the single males for some reason. Anyway, then um, what was the other thing? The the um, Oh, then women, for some reason, are shunted into jobs, into the less well-paying jobs. They go into industries that are that maybe are more flex time, and maybe that's also a cultural expectation that it's because they need to care for the children, and so they need flexible time. They're not, they can't do a strict, you know, uh, eight to five job. So all, all those factors are. I think coming into into play in in what we see in the labor force. May I share also my idea on that? I think uh, we should also uh, consider how we value human work uh, in light of just the numbers that we see. I think it's very important also to see that. There is value for the economy for mothers to stay at home. And that one is not valued properly. You know. And the welfare of the family, you know, a strong family, is not valued you know, because we tend to measure this per capita, the salaries that they receive. But just like to tell you that institutions here in the Philippines, micro lending institutions, value women than men. The biggest lending institution in the Philippines is ASA Philippines. They have multi-billion learning uh, loaning portfolio and they lend only to women. And I think sometimes I wonder when I pass by my alma mater, UP, I see their gender studies on women. But I think it should be the other way around. No? There should be gender studies for men no? because they're the ones who are, seem to be less trusted no? when it comes to giving them loans. No? If you look at ASA Philippine statistics, the collection rate from these women, multi-billion transactions, is 97%. So there is value that uh, this kind of work also gives to the economy, which is not properly accounted for. Because given the current bias that we have on how we measure the value of work. So it's not just numbers, for me, not just the numbers, no? but also on the impact on our society. Thank you. Okay, just to reframe the question. So the question is, why is it that women, um, how come like you don't join the workforce as much as men, when in fact a lot of them are actually highly educated, and in fact the society in general benefits from women's participation in the workforce? I think that's really cultural. Because in Ifugao, um, farm work is shared just as much as taking care of the kids. It's not just like women who do it. It's actually both. So if we're going to look at the different ways to, I think I, I showcase like four levels of responding to change or responding to a, a challenge. The second level, it's in terms of policy. That's when the Senate and the Congress would actually come in and discuss. But it has to go deeper than that. It has to be more generative. It has to be um, in terms of changing values and changing belief systems. And that takes time. So hindi enough you quick fix solutions of probably, I don't know, just coming up with a policy or something. So maybe um, there has to be a, like holding spaces. This is where people could come together from different sectors to really talk about how do we really change and transform um, mindsets. So I don't think like the politicians alone could actually address this. This is something, again, uh, there has to be a multi-stakeholder approach to, to address that one. And women should definitely be involved in that conversation. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. I can accommodate one last, one last question. Very journalist, but fundamental one. Uh, in acknowledging that the organismal circumstance of each member of human species are same. 
um, on the aspect of metabolism, growth, reproduction, and uh, responses to stimuli. Hence, we, we shift a bit from socioeconomics to socio-metabolics. And uh, there's this hypothesis um, th that uh, well-being and benign coexistence are only function of uh, defensible wealth distribution and reasonable income redistribution. Hence, we, uh, we have been looking for the panacea, and we propose that uh, we must enforce equitable and sustainable access to finite resources by legislation. Is humanity ready for this? Okay, it's the readiness of humanity. Anyone? Discussion is beyond my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I have nothing to say. <laughs> okay, so I was I was informed that I can accommodate one more question. I think there's a hand there. Yeah. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ila Gutierrez from the Asian Institute of Management. So, as a woman who's speaking here, um, I'm glad that these kinds of discussions are actually. Um, resurfacing in these kinds of um, conventions. So I guess just to start off, um, I'm coming from the AIM Tourism Center. Um, so I'll be coming from three different hats. First as an educator, as a tourism practitioner, and also as a researcher. So my question really is just to, I guess, tickle your mind a bit, since we did mention and we all agreed that non-cognitive skills and soft skills are those that are currently underappreciated or sort of like marginalized in the economy. So from where you are as educators, as business owners, are there any uh, ways that you suggest that we can better appreciate, incentivize, and recognize these kinds of soft skills so that more people, I guess, in the current and for the future workforce, they're more, I guess, confident that it's not just their cognitive skills that's developed, but also their non-cognitive skills. Thank you. Yeah, so, so as an economist, uh, my standard answer will be that you, you have to make the, you have to make them goals or, or um, desired outcomes of education. The problem with our education system is that we have not really, um, we don't have indicators. We, we, so that's why, that's why in my stylized facts, I said, you know, we have, we have to do the, I mean, it's not even in the, so I, I'm doing a project now with, uh, anyway, it's connected to the EDCOM2 on the economic regulation of Philippine higher education. And I've been looking at the at the constitution, at the CHED CMOs, and there's really nothing there that, the, I mean, from my reading so far, like, anyways, the, 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 the goals of education are not explicit. And so there are no indicators uh, for them so, so that are measurable and so that we can track progress. But if we put them in as, I th as uh, desired outcomes of the educational process, maybe then we can change the curriculum. Uh, Dr. Schleicher, Schleicher earlier said, you know, in the first, like in, in Japan, the, in the, my understanding is in the first three years of primary grade, grades, um, the school is not very structured. It's the, 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 the idea is just 
for the young pupils to really like to come to school. It's about socialization. It's about l learning empathy, being part of a, having friends, uh, having having joy in the in another place outside the home, and and that it's as low as that. And it and the and the instruction becomes more structured only in the fourth grade. But in our case, even in grade one, we have science, we have math, we have. It's too it's it's too concentrated on the cognitive skills. So so anyway, we, we just have to re I think we have to rethink. I would I would also like to <clears throat> approach this uh, in the context of our educational policy, which I agree hundred percent. Actually, being a president of a university, that uh, there are really serious gaps in our educational policy. Um, it de now depends now on our individual institutions to determine its educational philosophy on how it looks at the individual. For one, uh, in my viewpoint, I think the, this creative and uh, uh, the soft skills, rather, are really started early in the family. In fact, while Filipinos really thrive uh, abroad, and they are really favorite uh, physical therapists, nurses, workers, it's because of what they learned in their families. So the first educational philosophy for me is that our universities are a complement to our families, where the, which is the first place in which these non-cognitive st skills are acquired. That's why, despite the failures of educational institution, the Filipinos are still very well liked. And I attribute it to the family and closely knit atmosphere. It came out there in the survey of our, of our nation. So it's very important. And second, any educational philosophy is that while we specialize, it has to be founded on something that is human. I believe, uh, the professions will have to be built on the humanities. Uh, that's our educational philosophy that we would also like to follow. Because what the lockdown taught us, and personally me, many things I've learned were useless. When the time came to address, let's say, uh, a situation like a lockdown, you don't have any experience from that. So you just have to make sure that you have sufficient uh, non <laughs> uh, soft skills to deal with it. So. Depends on the educational philosophy now of an institution to fill this serious gap that uh, our educational uh, policy makers uh, have in our country. So I think I, I think Filipinos are our institutions like the NGOs no, are the best way to fill a, a very big gap that uh, is uh, found in our uh, government. So thanks to our NGOs, no, thanks to our institutions they fill in a very critical gap. So I think the question was already answered by uh, the um, doctors Alba uh, but, but, and doctor and doctor. <laughs> <laughs> but I just want to add to the to the question actually. I feel like it's not simply the non-cognitive skills which should also be introduced in the educational system but also traditional knowledge specifically for people indigenous peoples communities because that's also lost right. Um, if you are talking to, to people, for example, in, in, in our village, in Holongan village, they don't really care much about, you know, like the high polluting science or, or mathematics. Um, what's closer to them really is the environment or probably um, some, some traditional knowledge, tra traditional skills, some of which are not being passed down to them because there's no incentive for them to actually learn these things, right? Because it's not part of the curriculum or they, they're not getting paid for, for that. So I think, um, but the Department of Tourism has introduced a lot of programs to actually help help them uh, understand and learn these uh, knowledge. But I feel like there has to be closer ties between DepEd as well as the Department of Tourism to have a, a better approach in terms of um, the intervention in uh, instilling these kinds of knowledges to to the to the young ones, to the people in the indigenous community. So yeah. Okay, thank you very much. That's all the time we have for this panel discussion. Let's give a round of applause to our Dr. Michael Alba.
Dr. Winston Padoino and Mr. Victor Bagillat Jr. Okay, so before we end, we would like to present our certificate of appreciation to our discussant. I would like to call on PIDS President Dr. Aniceto Orbeta Jr. to award the certificates. The Philippine Institute for Development Studies presents the certificate of appreciation to Dr. Michael M. Alba for imparting his valuable insights and inspirations during the 10th Annual Public Policy Conference. Given this 19th day of September 2024 at Makati, Shangri-La, Makati City, Philippines. Signed, Dr. Aniceto C. Orbeta Jr., PIDS President. <laughs> Smile for smile already. One, two, three. One more, one more, one more. For example, another one for ready. One, two, and three. Smile for smile already. One, two, and three. Okay, okay, the same citation goes to Dr. Winston Conrad B. Padohinog. And the same citation goes to Mr. Victor Mari Bagillat Jr. And may I invite all our panelists for our final photo op. Reminder, snacks are available outside, please. And then after the snacks, please go back to the Isabella Ballroom for our closing plenary. Thank you very much.